Здравствуйте! Доброе утро! Добрый день! Добро пожаловать на урок русского языка! Итак, мы изучали урок номер 13. Урок номер 13. And we more or less completed the study of урок номер 13 in the Russian for Everybody textbook. So today we are meeting with you for a review of this lesson and then you will go ahead and take a test that is based on this particular unit of study in the textbook, урок номер 13. So today we will try to go one more time over all those things that you need to remember quite clearly for your test. So let's begin with dative pronouns. I think you know them very well, but let's take one more look at our dative pronouns. Мне, тебе, ему, ей, нам, вам, им, кому. Хорошо. Let's take this off the screen and please tell me what's the dative form of я. Мне, ты, тебе, мы, нам, вы, вам, они, им, он, ему. What's the dative of она? Ей. And what happens to the interrogative pronoun кто? Кому. Да? Кто changes into кому. Хорошо. Do you remember when, in what situations do we use the dative forms of personal pronouns? We use the dative case when we express a person's age and that person has to be in the dative case. We also use the dative case for indirect objects. We very often use the dative case with verbs of communication, right? And we have been over that, we've been going over that uh, many times. Then we also use the dative case when we construct sentences with expressions of necessity. I need to go to the library, you need to cook supper. Мне нужно пойти в библиотеку, тебе нужно приготовить ужин. So there are several situations that call for the use of the dative case and that's why we keep coming back to what are the dative forms of personal pronouns? Do you remember them? And I hope that you do. No? Хорошо. So, expressions of necessity. What are the two words in the Russian language that help us say that it is necessary for us to do something? Нужно and надо. So, let's take a quick look at this. Expressions of necessity. Нужно, надо. Мне нужно пойти в магазин. You remember that in, in the sentences of, of this type, we use the dative case of the person, then the word нужно or надо, and after that we add a phrase that expresses what it is that we need to do. Мне нужно пойти в магазин. And there is absolutely no difference between нужно and надо in meaning. They mean the same thing, it is necessary, so you can use them interchangeably. Хорошо, хорошо. Итак, мне нужно пойти в магазин и купить мясо, рыбу, овощи, фрукты, хлеб и молоко. Вера и Антон поедут на юг. Им надо купить новый чемодан. Хорошо, хорошо. Do you remember, do you still remember the little rhyme that we uh, learned with expressions of necessity? Мне нужно читать. Тебе нужно писать. Нам нужно работать. А вам отдыхать. So let's say it one more time. Мне нужно читать. Тебе нужно писать. Нам нужно работать, а вам отдыхать. 
If you remember this rhyme, then you are in a very good shape when it comes to expressions of necessity and how to use them. Ну, хорошо. А сейчас мы посмотрим маленький видеофильм. And in this video, you will hear several conversations. I want you to listen very closely. Listen for the use of expressions of necessity here. Итак, пожалуйста. Андрей, ты уже сделал уроки? Давай пойдем в кино. Нет, мне еще осталось написать упражнение номер два. А ты уже сделала уроки? Да, я уже сделала уроки. Здравствуй, Наташа. Куда ты идешь? В магазин. Мне нужно купить хлеб, молоко и чай. А что ты делаешь? Я иду домой. Пока. Пока. Оля, давай пойдем сегодня в кино. Хорошо, давай. Ты уже купил билеты? Нет еще. Тогда нам надо спешить. Фильм начинается в 7 часов. И нам еще надо купить билеты. Хорошо. Хорошо. А сейчас let us discuss the difference between должен and нужно. Должен and нужно. We can say он должен написать письмо. He must write a letter. Он должен написать письмо. But we can also say ему нужно написать письмо. He needs to write a letter. Ему нужно написать письмо. What is the difference between these two sentences? Let's take a look at this. Он должен написать письмо. Ему нужно написать письмо. Now in the first sentence we are using the nominative case. Он and then должен is a short form adjective and you remember for this word we have the masculine, feminine, neuter and plural forms. In the second sentence we have the dative case of the personal pronoun ему. That's the dative case of он. And it is followed by the word нужно. This word never changes. It always stays in this form. Нужно. Ему нужно написать письмо. There's also a, a very strong interest in me, a very strong difference in meaning between these two sentences. When we say on должен, we imply that it is his moral responsibility to write this letter. Он должен написать письмо. When we say ему нужно написать письмо, we imply that the external circumstances make it necessary for him to write this letter. So the responsibility rests with the circumstances, but not with the person involved. Ему нужно написать письмо. Ну, хорошо. Хорошо. So you remember that we say он должен, but ему нужно. With нужно and надо, you always have to use the dative case for the person. Ему нужно, ей нужно, о, мне нужно написать письмо. А сейчас нам нужно сделать упражнение. The circumstance is very soon you will be taking a test. Make it necessary for us to practice a bit more. Нам нужно сделать упражнение. Возьмите свои ручки, карандаши, тетради. And I want you to change these two sentences with должен into sentences with нужно or надо. So change these sentences using expressions of necessity.
Так, ну хорошо, хорошо. Итак, вы уже сделали это упражнение, и давайте посмотрим, что вы написали. Она должна купить продукты. Ей нужно купить продукты. It is necessary for her. Ей нужно купить продукты. And your second sentence should say им нужно сделать уроки. Or instead of нужно, you can use the word надо. Им надо сделать уроки. But the important part here is for you to use the dative case. The dative case. Хорошо. Let us practice a bit more and I want you to change two more sentences. Again, the task remains the same. Change the sentences and use expressions of necessity. Ну, хорошо. Вы готовы? Are you ready? Вы готовы? Я думаю, что вы уже сделали это упражнение. Итак, номер три. Он должен спешить. How can we change this sentence? Ему надо спешить. Посмотрите, пожалуйста. Ему надо спешить. Ему надо спешить. And instead of надо... If you'd like to, you can use нужно. Ему нужно спешить. И номер четыре. Мне нужно сделать это. Мне нужно сделать это. Your sentences should begin with the dative case. With нужно and надо, we always use the dative case for the person. Хорошо. Хорошо. Молодцы. Another very important thing that we learned from урок номер 13 is the use of the reflexive possessive modifier свой. Свой. Remember, we discussed свой, its meaning and its function in the sentence very carefully. You remember that свой always refers back to the subject of the sentence and establishes the relationship of ownership. And that the subject is performing a certain action on something that belongs to him, not to another person. Борис читает свою книгу. Да? Борис is reading his own book. Хорошо. Свой is a modifier, and it means that it agrees with the noun in number, gender, and case. And you should also remember that свой changes endings exactly like the modifier мой. So on pages 192 and 193 in your textbook, there is a chart that tells you how to change endings on modifiers when they occur in the accusative case. And you can always go back to that chart, look at the column with мой, and change endings on свой accordingly. Мой and свой have exactly the same pattern for the endings. Ну, хорошо. Since uh, these endings are so important, you have to remember that in the modifier-noun relationship, the noun leads and the modifier follows. If a noun changes its ending in the accusative case, then the modifier has to change too. But if the noun stays the same, then the modifier doesn't have to do anything. With masculine inanimate nouns, 
neuter nouns and plural inanimate nouns. Everything is easy. These nouns do not change. But feminine nouns and masculine animate nouns change their endings. And it means that we need to remember how to change endings on modifiers. So let's look at these examples. Nina положила свою книгу на стол. Да? Свою книгу. Feminine. Nina положила свою книгу на стол. Хорошо. And let's look at an example with a masculine animate noun. Nina читает и не видит своего брата Максима. Да? Брат Максим, uh, masculine animate nouns. In the accusative case, they receive the a ending. And we have to put the ego ending on the modifier to make it accusative. Masculine animate accusative. Хорошо. Хорошо. Ну а сейчас давайте сделаем упражнение. Возьмите свои ручки, карандаши, тетради и давайте сделаем упражнение. We are practicing with the reflexive possessive modifier свой and I need you to complete the following sentences with the appropriate forms of the modifier свой. Итак, пожалуйста. Ну, хорошо, хорошо. Давайте посмотрим, как вы сделали это упражнение. Итак, Максим положил свою книгу на стол. Книгу is a feminine noun in the accusative case. We change the ending to U and we have to change the ending on the modifier. Свою. We, we are making this modifier agree with noun in number, gender, and case. Свою книгу. Я не вижу своего друга. A друг is a masculine animate noun. In the accusative case, it received the a ending. And on the modifier, we have to put the ending ого. Своего друга. Masculine animate accusative. Своего друга. Я не вижу своего друга. I do not see my friend. I expect him to be here, but for some reason I do not see my friend. Я не вижу своего друга. No? Хорошо. Хорошо. And now let's practice with asking questions. During class, you mostly answer my questions, or I hope that you do. But I need you to receive good practice with asking questions, asking different types of questions. So you will be prepared for communication when it's necessary. Итак, возьмите свои ручки, карандаши, тетради. И давайте сделаем упражнение. This time I want you to ask questions about the highlighted phrases. Ask questions about the highlighted phrases.
Ну, хорошо, хорошо. Давайте посмотрим, какие вопросы вы написали. Номер один. Им нужно купить новый чемодан. If we don't know what it is that they need to do, how can, you, how can we pose a question? Что им нужно сделать? Да? Что? What? What do they need to do? Что им нужно сделать? Номер два. Андрей поедет на юг. And if we don't know where he will go, we simply ask, куда, where to, куда он поедет? Where will he go? Куда он поедет? Номер три. Завтра, tomorrow, завтра мы пойдем в кино. If we don't know about the time, the day, how do we pose a question? We start with когда, when. Когда мы пойдем в кино? Завтра. Когда мы пойдем в кино? Ну, хорошо, молодцы, молодцы. Итак, сегодня мы много работаем. Мы уже много сделали. We have accomplished a lot, but there are other things that we still need to go over. Итак, давайте продолжать. Let's continue. This time I want you to tell me what you will say in Russian in these situations. So tell your friend that you need to do your homework. Tell your friend that you need to do your homework. You are talking about yourself, right? So you start with Мне нужно сделать уроки. I need to do my homework. Мне нужно сделать уроки. Хорошо. You meet your friend at a department store. So ask him what he needs to buy. Что тебе нужно купить? What do you need to buy? Что тебе нужно купить? Now, how will you pose this question to a female friend? In exactly the same way. You don't have to change a thing now. Что тебе нужно купить? You remember that the word нужно doesn't change. Нужно or надо always stay нужно and надо. They don't change. So, что тебе надо купить? О, что тебе нужно купить? Хорошо. Tell your friend, tell your friend that you need to hurry. Мне нужно спешить. I need to hurry. It is necessary for me to hurry. Мне нужно спешить. Хорошо. And uh, finally, ask your pen pal how old he is or how old she is. Do you remember that one? Сколько тебе лет? Да? Сколько тебе лет? You are probably corresponding with someone who is in your age group, so you can afford to be very familiar. Сколько тебе лет? And then when you identify your own age, you begin with мне. Uh, мне 17 лет, мне 18 лет, мне 19 лет. Ну, хорошо. Хорошо. So, right after this lesson, I need you to start working on your additional exercises and there will be more practice with all the grammar material that you need to brush up on for your test. All those things that we learned with you from урок номер 13. And now let me tell you what exactly you need to study for this upcoming test. Итак, what to study for the test? Take your textbooks and find урок номер 13. Урок номер 13. Oh, very carefully. 
study sections 13.1 and 13.3. You need to review expressions of necessity and the use of the reflexive possessive modifier svoj. Also review dative case of pronouns and then very carefully go over, go over all the new vocabulary that we learned with you from Urok Nomer 13, Lesson 13 in the Russian for Everybody textbook. Your test is, of course, based on Urok Nomer 13. Итак, сегодня мы много работали. Мы много говорили по-русски, много Читали по-русски, много писали по-русски. Сегодня мы много сделали. So please continue your review with additional exercises. Study hard. And uh, I wish you lots of luck on that test. Спасибо и до свидания. Welcome to our Russian World Cultural Program. Today you will have the privilege and opportunity to explore Russian folk music and dance. Folk music, dance, arts and crafts of Russia are the integral part of Russian culture, which reflects the spirit and history of Russian people. Folk music and art grew from deeply rooted traditions that have been passed on from generation to generation for centuries. Today, you will learn about different folk instruments such as the balalaika, bayan, guitar, and wooden spoons. You will hear Russian folk songs and view live performances by Russian folk musicians and dancers. Their energy and authentic presentation will give you a genuine taste of a real Russian carnival or festival. The Russian folk groups will perform traditional and internationally known and loved songs. There may even be an opportunity for you to participate. You will also study different kinds of Russian folk art, such as Hachlamat, Gorodets painting, Matryoshka and Palich painting, and see its beauty, artistic perfection, refined qualities and marvelous craftsmanship. 
As you watch the presentation, we would like you to keep this question in mind. How does Russian folk art, crafts, dance and music reflect Russian culture? Sudarinya and Carousel are Russian folk groups which perform traditional Russian and Cossack folk songs and gypsy romances. The audiences delight in seeing and hearing traditional Russian instruments such as the balalaika, bayan or button accordion, guitar, wooden spoons and Russian horn among others. The balalaika is one of the most beloved and popular Russian folk instruments. It is a stringed musical instrument with a long neck the body of the instrument has a triangular shape. Balalaikas may have two to four strings, but most have three strings. They vary in size. Some balalaikas are so large they must rest on the floor, but most are much smaller. The balalaika circulated throughout Russia with only two strings until the 16th century, when Ivan the Terrible lived up to his name and banished all court minstrels and wandering musicians. The instrument disappeared for a long time and it did not emerge again until the 18th century. Ukrainian-born Sergei Vashenko dazzles audiences on the balalaika. Beginning his musical education on this traditional Russian instrument at an early age, Sergei studied his art at the most prominent schools of music in Russia. We find an interesting description of balalaika players in the Russian writer Fedor Dostoevsky's Notes from the Dead House. The orchestra began to play. The balalaikas were unimaginable. The deftness with which fingers plucked the strings was equal to a most agile of tricks. Every possible dance tune was played. In the most animated places, the balalaika players knocked the sounding board with their knuckles. The tone, the taste, the rendition, the handling of the instruments, the interpretation, everything was highly individual, original. The accordion is a reed type musical instrument worn on straps around the shoulder. The player stretches and compresses bellows, forcing air through metal tongues to make them vibrate. The right hand plays keys arranged in the order of the scale, like piano keys, while the left hand presses buttons that produce single tones and chords. The instrument you hear has 11 rows of buttons with 87 notes. Vladimir Kalyazin hails from the Baltic state of Latvia. He began developing his skills in the Bayan accordion at the age of five. Vladimir graduated from St. Petersburg Conservatory. His talent has earned him accolades from all over the world. Vladimir's Bayan is a Russian five-row chromatic accordion. The balalaika and the Bayan are frequently played together. Sergei Vashenko and Vladimir Kalyazin have joined together to form an ensemble called Kalinka. Kalinka features both of these virtuoso performers who have toured extensively through Russia, Europe, and North and South America. Dmitry Chaskis, a native Russian, uses the guitar and a popular folk song, Moscow Nights, to teach Russian vocabulary in a Russian language class. See if you can join in with Dmitry. Goes. Yes, Если б знали вы, как мне дороги подмосковные вечера, речка движется и не движется, вся из лунного серебра. Песня слышится и не слышится в эти тихие вечера. Песня слышится и не слышится в эти тихие вечера. 
рассвет уже все заметнее. Так, пожалуйста, будь добра, не забудь и ты эти летние подмосковные вечера. Не забудь и ты эти летние Подмосковные вечера. Хорошо. Well, this may take a little bit more practice both for you and for me, but uh, I think it's a great song and I would like you to hear it once again. Если б знали вы, как мне дороги подмосковные вечера. Если б знали вы, как мне дороги подмосковные вечера. Речка движется и не движется, Вся из лунного серебра. Песня слышится и не слышится В эти тихие вечера. Песня слышится Слышится в эти дикие вечера, а рассвет уже все замедлее. Так, пожалуйста, будь добра, не забудь и ты. Подмосковные вечера, не забудь и ты эти летние подмосковные вечера. Folk songs are remarkable for their diversity. The early songs, Kharavod, Round Dance, and Calendar songs, relating to the seasonal year, were preserved from the period before Russia's conversion to Christianity in the 10th century. A unique place in both literature and music is occupied by the Brulini, heroic ballads, which describe events occurring from the 11th to the 16th centuries. Some of the Brulini, were taken over by the historical songs describing specific historical events that occurred between the 16th and the 18th centuries. Another kind of song is the Duchovnia Stichi, spiritual verses, which are melodically similar to the Builini and the historical songs, but employ subject matter taken from the Bible and the lives of the saints. Wedding songs occupy a special and substantial place in Russian folk music. Collected over a long historical period, they form an essential part of the traditional peasant wedding, a long and elaborate ritual accompanied by songs and laments. Other types of songs are the comic or humorous songs performed by the skamaruchi, the Russian clowns or buffoons. Unique in Russian folk song is the so-called lyrical song. Noted for its rich, melodic content, rhythmic freedom and wide vocal range, the lyrical song may be said to express the poetic feelings of the performer. Other types of songs include town songs, chastushka, woody jingles, Christmas carols, soldier and sailor songs, prison songs, revolutionary songs, and children's songs.
A very popular Russian song is Katyusha. Here, students perform Katyusha at the Russian festival in Dallas, Texas. Russian folk song and folk dance are closely connected. From the earliest period of Russian history, there is evidence to show that folk dance played an important part in pagan and subsequently Christian ceremonies. The various events of the seasonal year were commemorated in song and dance. An important part of these events was a round dance called Chara Vod, performed and accompanied by dramatic action and singing. The Russian Carousel performs an outstanding musical program of folk songs and dances based on traditional fairy tales of Russia. They bring fantasy to life with the help of music, props, puppetry, and masks. Also, the Carousel presents an extraordinary collection of traditional Russian musical instruments and antique folk costumes dating from the 18th and 19th centuries. Famous Russian folk dances include the squatting dance and the dance with bent knees. The trepak, which comes from the Old Russian verb trepat, to stamp the feet, is a dance in 2-4 time, performed at a lively tempo. From the frozen Siberian city of Krasnoyarsk comes a dance company with unique treasures of folk dance. Krasnoyarsk Dance Company of Siberia. Based on Siberian folk dances and songs passed down over hundreds of years, the ensemble transports audiences to the vast and beautiful places of Siberia with their deep folk melodies and original costumes. The performers follow one after another in a symphony of dance, at times slow and graceful, and other times swift and sparkling. While talking about Russian dancers, we cannot help mentioning the gypsy and Ukrainian dances. Both have a great influence on Russian folk dancing. This gypsy dance is performed by students of Krasovska Ballet Jeunesse of Dallas. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
the Kazachuk and the Gopak are both Ukrainian dances. Enjoy beautiful Ukrainian dances performed by Zarya Ukrainian Dance Ensemble. Zarya Ukrainian dance ensembles dance style and costumes represent geographic location, climatic conditions, and spiritual and traditional beliefs of various regions of Ukraine. It is a dark night in the Carpathian Mountains, and the Hutsuls gather to celebrate the festival of Ivan Kupala, a mythical matchmaker who brings happiness and prosperity to a deserving man and maiden. Mystery and anticipation fill the air. Mountain horns signal the approach of the man who builds a ritual fire and dances the secretive arcan, followed by the rousing couple dance, the Kolomeika. We find ourselves at the Zaporozhian siege on the banks of the Dnipro. The Zaporozhian Cossack Brotherhood, led by their hetman, celebrate the arrival of a new recruit. During their sword and spear training, the hetman informs the Brotherhood that they must ride out to defend their homeland. Triumphant Cossacks return to their village, greeted with traditional bread and salt, and are reunited with their families. The Cossacks and villagers break into a spontaneous celebration with the Hopak, considered the national dance of the Ukraine. You have had an opportunity to enjoy different kinds of Russian folk music, songs and dancers. You will continue to hear Russian folk music as you learn about Russian folk art in part 2.